feet. So I'm Greg Chaffron. I got the role of just giving a little bit of context for what we do here as a team. Um, I kind of went through uh, the past five years of looking at our digital documentation. We got five years, but these numbers are preliminary. So like the first year, we're kind of easing into the system. So there is some stuff missing in those first years. But just to give you a little bit of idea of who we're out there helping, you can see we help a lot of hikers and a lot of climbers. And then it kind of gets into the hunters, the snowmobilers, the mountain bikers, and some of the winter sports. And when we talk about what we're doing out there for them, mostly what we're doing is search. We're going out looking for lost people. And that's that kind of bottom half, the green and the blue, where we go look for them and then help bring them out on their own power. And then the other half of that graph is really where we get more into the technical rescue side of things. And that's where we're using more of our, our skills as a team. So a lot of questions, kind of our goal is to answer your questions. You know, We're kind of revamping our whole education outreach program. And there's been a lot happening this summer. And so we've been hearing a lot of questions. One of these questions we keep hearing is, are we doing more missions? Are we doing more missions? So like I said, 2012, we don't have all of our documentation right there digitized just yet. But it's kind of steady. You know, We've certainly had more recoveries this summer than previously. But this is also, I've learned, does not account for just calls that go to the, the Pickin County Sheriff looking for help. A lot of those don't actually turn into missions. And a lot of these missions actually aren't, you know, we go out, a couple people start looking, and then they come out on their own. So we go out on a lot of missions that don't actually turn into much. But to do that, we do a tremendous amount of training. So this graph kind of shows the hours we put in to do what we do out there. So that blue line on the bottom there is mission hours, with the yellow line being training hours. So we're going out, we're spending a tremendous amount of time on missions, but even more time training to be able to do that safely. And the numbers on top there, that's total hours. That's how many hours we put in per year as a team. Um, but again, we're volunteers, so we don't really need to count hours, right? It's not like we're getting reimbursed or anything. So we put in way more time on that. That just doesn't get logged. This is time that's getting logged out on missions. Um, last thing I wanted to kind of bring up here is, well, what does our team look like? And so I threw out this graph looking at basically all the different members on our team. That red dot av uh, represents the average member. And what I think is really amazing Looking at that is how many members we have kind of in this range here that have been on the team for a really long time and are still super involved. I think it's super impressive. And so you can see coming through here, we kind of have a couple waves of rescuers coming up learning and we're super beneficial to have this really inspirational group who's been on the team for so long and we continue to learn, we continue to kind of change our systems and learn new things. And so again, you know, we're an anonymous group but if you're able to get into that back hallway, you can see plaques for these members who have been on for 25 years. And so if you know any of them, you're lucky. So lastly, kind of getting into, we are kind of going through it and we were looking at some of these themes that we keep seeing and keep happening out there on, on these accidents. And really sometimes it comes down to kind of some basic stuff. And we keep coming back around, we kept bringing up the term 10 essentials and so I just kind of want to throw that up, kind of thinking that maybe a lot of people don't know what the 10 essentials are. And that is kind of just your basic gear list that you should have when you go out. And it's not just having the gear, but it's knowing how to use it, right? So you have your navigation, but you got to know what that's for and know where you're going, and know where you are. That's generally where we deal with people is they're struggling in the navigation side of things. You got to just also be prepared for the elements. There's a lot out there, right? As far as sun sunglasses, extra clothing, lights, first aid supplies, and we're talking about first aid, you gotta be able to manage your issue there, but that's also talking about going and getting extra help. How do you initiate rescue? And we definitely see a difference on rescues and the outcomes when our subject can contact us faster and get us information. Sometimes all we know is somebody's missing or somebody's hurt, and we gotta go out there and figure out what's happening and then come and get supplies. But there's a lot of ways you, know, you can get outside communication. Um, and that becomes pretty important, right? Fire, having the proper gear. And that's gonna depend on the sport. So if you're going climbing, you're gonna need a rope. If you're going the backcountry, you're gonna want avalanche gear in the winter. Um, nutrition, hydration, emergency shelter. It's basically planning for things going wrong. And that's kind of generally where we spend a lot of our time is dealing with events when they go wrong and then training for us to be able to kind of respond to that. So that was just kind of a little overview of what we've seen, just digging through some of the information so the goal is here, we kind of wanted to show you, we got our 
panel is comprised of the board here of Mountain Rescue. So we wanted each one of our board members to go through and just give a quick overview of what they do in their position as in their role and their job on the board. So we we're gonna start right now with Deb Kelly. She's our wonderful secretary. All right, so I'd like to give you guys um, a little bit of background on, um, on the organization. Um, Mountain Rescue was incorporated in 1965, um, but the local mountaineers were carrying people off the mountains and out of the backcountry back for a few years, you know, quite a few years before that. There's uh, some old diaries from some of the old mountaineers back in the 50s where we have stories of people uh, being uh, involved in a, in a three-day mission to get someone off the Maroon Bells. Um, we were one of the early teams in Colorado to, to form and become a member of the Mountain Rescue Association, which is a national organization that um, accredits teams, um, and we're, we belong to the Rocky Mountain region of the Mountain Rescue Association. Mountain Rescue Aspen started in a small cabin in the 600 um, what, block of West Main Street um, in a little place that the city now has some offices in. A lot of you have been here for a while probably remember that little, our, our little cabin there. Um, our new facility is a product of a very generous donor who was rescued from a plane crash as a child back in the 70s. With her support and the support of a lot of other community members, um, we were able to build this center to house all of our gear, which before that had been spread all over the county at various people's garages. Um, <laughs> And, and allow us to run our missions more efficiently and also to hold community education events like tonight. Um, we have around 50 full time, full and support members. Um, that kind of varies. I think we're at 48 right now, but you know we've been up to 55, so somewhere in there. Um, and we also have a, a cadre right now of new pledges. I think we have uh, nine new pledges that have signed on since June when we started kind of a pledge class at that point. Um, members start out as a, a pledge, and that's a probationary status. Uh, they move to support member, and once you become a support member, you can participate in um, missions and trainings. Um, and then after attending quite a few trainings and passing a skills test, and this process may take a couple of years, um, support members can then be voted in by the team to a full member uh, status. Um, from there, members can move up to rescue leader where they're um, helping to run missions or even volunteer as a board member, which this is the board right now. Uh, as secretary, I do the normal uh, secretary stuff. I keep track of the member status and qualifications, everyone's medical qualifications. Um, we have at a minimum for membership, you have to have um, uh, first responder. And, but we have quite a few EMTs and a couple of paramedics on the team too, so, and, and, and a doc, couple of doctors, so. Um, I do that, I keep uh, the records of the corporation, take meeting notes, things like that. Um, the, uh, talking about the rescue leaders, there's two rescue leaders that are on call 24-7, um, so at any given point in the year, there's always two people who are ready to respond if the sheriff gives us a call. Sheriff notice, notifies us uh, via pager on our cell phones right now. Um, and those two people will respond to start setting up the mission. I'm gonna let Liz talk a little bit more about how a mission's run and how, how it comes together. Um, trainings are held on an average of three to four evenings um, and one day a month. That's kind of our average uh, every month. We have evening trainings and a, and a day training. Um, the requirement for meetings and trainings is based on the status of is your status on the team. So kind of the longer you've been here, the more trainings you've been to, the kind of less you have to, to, um, to train. Um, most active members and rescue leaders actually participate way beyond the minimum requirement. Um, we have members from all walks of life with a variety of skills, but we all chip in to make missions happen, trainings happen, and education events happen. Um, you know, besides the member who might be out on the out on the uh, mountain, side of the mountain, there's a bunch of other members back here or going to get sandwiches or getting gear ready or getting gear out into the field. Um, everything from ordering up a helicopter um, 
to just making sure every everything gets put away at the end of the mission. So it's uh, missions are, are a lot of work, but everyone really chips in, no matter what their status on the team is. So um, just our, real quick, our education programs that we've had in the past consist of Avalanche Safety Seminar in January, our Hug a Tree program that we do in local schools, and various community events like the Golden Leaf um, Half Marathon that we help out with. Our goal moving forward is to have an annual summer safety program that will educate community members to the hazards encountered on our local peaks and general backcountry safety. So that's kind of where we're headed, maybe to do that in May or June each year and also distribute that information online through various websites, blogs, social media, so that we can also reach the visitors who come to our area. So we're a pretty dedicated bunch of volunteers. We've become good friends, and we're kind of like a big family. So it's a great organization. Thanks. Yeah. So on that note, I don't know if we mentioned, we are doing a live stream. So we're trying to expand and get out to the front range. And so it's going to be maybe somebody's watching out there now. Thank you. So as you noticed, talking about rescues, we're going to move on to Liz Bergdahl. She's our rescue leader coordinator. And she'll talk about how rescues kind of get run. Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm the rescue leader coordinator, which means that I'm in charge of the group of people that are um, the ones that are on call uh, to get phone calls from the sheriff's department uh, when they have a rescue um, that is needed, uh, needs mountain rescue. So the first thing I wanted to kind of just talk about is ICS, um, Incident Command System. Um, every member is in this on this team is expected to go through some training to learn what the ICS system is. and what it really boils down to is it's a standardized approach at uh, a command and control um, and coordination of emergency response. So we all have a common language that we speak um, when we can take our team to another, uh, another incident that may involve multiple agencies and we can integrate um, seamlessly. So we know who to, who to, to go to, who, to, um, who our, where is in charge of where we're supposed to go, what our mission is um, and what exactly we're supposed to do. Uh, so we are, every person is expected to learn this um, as a member and those of us that are rescue leaders know this intimately because we're the ones that run the mission. So most of the time when the Sheriff's Department calls us, uh, the Sheriff's Department, be, the, whoever's the deputy, becomes the incident commander of, of whatever mission is going on. Um, Mountain Rescue, we carry basically the rest of the load, which is everything else below, which would be operations, planning, logistics, um, until we, uh, if, if we expand um, and things become larger, then we may delegate different people to those different tasks. But otherwise, um, we carry every, uh, every one of those uh, uh, disciplines until we actually um, dish it off to somebody else and they take care of that. Uh, so ICS is basically um, something that's used nationwide. Um, FEMA uses it. Uh, they develop their own system as well that's similar. They just have different names for it, but, um, but it's something that's used across the country. Uh, so within, as Debbie mentioned, we have um, rescue leaders that are on call. We call the person that may be on duty for two weeks uh, at the beginning of a month, end of a month, a 501, uh, and the assistant rescue leader would be 502. So how a mission would get started um, is if someone were to call 911 with an emergency, uh, they may call on the phone, on a cell phone. They may call, may, they actually can text. I don't know if you know that, but you can actually text to 911. Um, and the dispatcher receives that message. Um, they may hear the whole story of what's going on out there in the field. Uh, the di dispatcher will then call um, a deputy that's um, out there on the, uh, in the field uh, and say they have something going on. They give them the information. Uh, the deputy then decides if it's something that they can actually handle themselves, if it's just an overdue person. Um, there's lots of different ways, of course, to contact. So if you're out in the field and you have something that's called a spot or an in-reach, um, there is a way to be able to get a location of where somebody is. Uh, but if the, dis if the deputy doesn't know where this message is coming from, if they just get a call, oh, somebody's up on you know, Sopras Peak and they're injured but they don't know a location, then that, of course, turns into a search for us. So we need to find, out, find them first. And we have a mnemonic that we use is 
uh, locate, access, stabilize, and transport last. And so that's the first thing we have to do is locate them. So um, if the dispatcher, or I'm sorry, not the dispatcher, doesn't know, but the, the deputy can find out where the person is, they will do that, um, try to figure out what's wrong if they need us. They'll then call the 501 on duty, the, the rescue leader on duty, tell us what's going on, and we will then meet here at the cabin and what we call, still call the cabin, even this large building, um, up in our communications room and um, start whatever we need to do. So, um, you know, we may need to decide if it's uh, an injury and the person is um, severely injured and we have a, a, an idea as to where they are, we might actually use a helicopter. We might dispatch a helicopter up and look for the person. Um, if we uh, feel like it's something that we don't need an immediate response, um, we may need to, uh, you know, put a, a field team in to go find the person and take equipment in. Um, but basically, we have to decide what kind of response that we need, whether it's emergent, whether we need a helicopter, whether we just hike in, um, do we need ATVs, do we need snowmobiles, um, and we put out a page to the team, uh, seeing what members are available, and they come to the cabin here, we put together teams and we send them out into the field, briefing them before they go out with whatever they need uh, for the mission. So that's kind of how things get started and they will rapidly expand from there. So um, that's just kind of the basics of how things get started. Um, and later on, if you guys have questions, then we can talk about that then. Thanks. Sweet, thanks, Les. So that's kind of how missions really get run. We have room, and we have some really lovely people here. If you guys <laughs> want to come sit down, they look friendly. <laughs> There's plenty of room, nice soft chairs. So next, we're gonna hear a little bit more from uh, Justin Hood. He's gonna talk more from the operations side of things. Just that's how kind of missions run, but it's you know it takes a lot to keep it running and keep the lights on. So Justin will tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I'm the director of util uh, utilities of operations here. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well be the director of utilities. Yeah. Yeah. So the, that's key. Yeah. <laughs> And as a director of operations, it's mostly about maintaining the building uh, equipment, the way equipment is used, and knowing when to replace things. So it's kind of a constant maintenance. Um, but things in, in terms of going out on a mission, <clears throat> you can have small hard costs like a, a rope that gets damaged, and maybe it's something that's $300 up to a flight hour in a Blackhawk is about 6,000 hours, $6,000 in terms of fuel costs. Um, it can be anywhere in the middle there. And there's a lot of dynamic things that Mountain Rescue uses in terms of its tools and assets when we're out there in the field. Sometimes we're just starting as walking and all of a sudden we've got to haul in a litter. Well, titanium litter is, uh, $2,500, and, and you're bringing that thing in, it's in two pieces, you're assembling it on the fly, you've got a tagline, and you're lowering folks down a trail, and, and you need a lot of hands. So the equipment and the way things are used is um, it's pretty interesting. We're trying to outfit a lot of the trucks so that there's uniformity between all of them, so you don't go into one truck and all of a sudden you don't have what you thought was in the other truck. So the redundancy of having all of these items in in multiple trucks is uh, tedious. And to make sure that these things get put back is just as tedious. Uh, there's a lot of times that our demobilizing is just as long as our rescue. So if we're out for a few hours and maybe there were some folks that weren't available, we're gonna send out a page and see if more folks are available to come help us break things down, get them all put back and uh, be rescue ready for the next deal. Awesome. That's, that covers it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So we're going to move on from then. We're going to talk a little bit more uh, from our vice president and secretary, or treasurer, I'm sorry, vice president and treasurer. Jordan White is going to tell us a little bit how we're financed and uh, some of the other kind of helicopter general issues. Cool. Um, yeah, so he kind of hinted at some of the helicopter, $6,000 $6, an hour. Um, one thing I think it's kind of important for people to know is that, you know, rescue, Colorado is a no charge for rescue state. And that's definitely not true across the country. You know, it varies by state, but we have a state statute that says they can't charge you for rescue. So um, just kind of like, but that said, rescue still costs a lot of money, as he was talking about. And so uh, we are 
um, funded by grants and donations here at Mount Rescue Aspen. And um, it's, you know, people ask, ask us a lot of times, is the Corsar card, is that insurance for me? I'm like, no, that's insurance for your local rescue team is what it really is. Um, it allows us to kind of re- recoup some of the costs that you guys might, that might be incurred in, you know, in a rescue for whoever's out there. Um, almost all the vendors we use are nonprofits from flight for life to care flight to, um, the national guard. They, uh, none of them are going to charge you for all of this countless hours of search time. They might spend 15 hours of helicopter time looking for you. You're never going to see a bill for it. Um, the medical providers tend to act like an ambulance. So, you know, if you do take a medical transport, eventually you might, you know, it's just like your health insurance for everything else. But, uh, I think it's important for people to know and not be afraid to call based on costs. Um, right now, Mountain Rescue is in the middle of a, you know, a fairly big fundraising push that I think Jeff will talk a little bit more about. But um, on the uh, on the hats front, we've been doing quite a bit more. Um, I guess we could call them higher risk uh, operations lately. Um, you're seeing people getting stuck farther out in the mountains and in more uh, precarious spots and we're spending a lot more time doing uh, actually live hoists underneath a lot of Blackhawk helicopters and so that's fairly new for the mountain rescue world in most of the state and I think it's kind of um, it's cool to be uh, partnered with those guys headed down that road. Sweet awesome awesome thanks a lot thanks for everything. So next we are going to hear from Doug Paley he is our training officer. He's the one who's in charge of keeping us rescue ready. It was an exciting year. This year, we just had our reaccreditation test. And so you can kind of tell you a little bit more about what that whole process is like. I had to add a couple of things to my vocabulary there. Sweet. I like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to first thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, as many of you know, uh, we're in the business of not only rescue, but we're very much committed to education. And what you're seeing tonight is just uh, another kickoff of uh, what we're going to be doing in 2017 going into 2018 on avalanche awareness as well as peak awareness. Uh, My name is Doug Paley. As Greg mentioned, I am the training officer. And my job is pretty much to make sure that this team is rescue ready. It's a term we use quite often. And rescue ready to us is really being prepared uh, to be deployed almost immediately. So when our members come into the rescue center and there is a mission, and often these missions have a very high sense of urgency, that they're ready to be teamed up with another member to solve a problem. So uh, I'm going to take off on uh, a little bit of what Liz said. She kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but I love that acronym, uh, LAST. She mentioned LAST, and as Liz mentioned, uh, LAST is um, uh, locate, access, stabilize, and transport. And in a way, that's kind of uh, what we train for. And when we talk about, let me share some some examples here. When we talk about locate, uh, locating involves a lot of skills that we developed which have to do with search. And when we're talking about search, we're looking at uh, a lot of navigation skills. Um, And we train on really trying to understand where our subjects are. And sometimes it's it's not that easy. So once we focus on locate, uh, how do we get to them? Access. Uh, Jordan mentioned uh, uh, HATS. HATS is High Altitude um, uh, Aviation Training Center uh, School. And... uh, but we have to get to these subjects, and a lot of, a lot of the ways that we uh, train in our rescue team is to do a lot of complex rigging. And we, we learn how to be safe out there. We learn how to access our subjects, and often the uh, areas that we're uh, trying to reach tend to be difficult, as you, I'm sure, have read over some of the rescues we've done this summer. So um, the other thing about access is we do it on all seasons and in all weather. So it's one thing to train at the rescue center on our deck. It's another thing to do it when the wind's blowing on top of one of these peaks and it's cold. So stabilizing. Uh, Stabilizing, we'll talk a little bit more. I'm sure Jeff will mention, uh, talk a little bit more about our medical. 
But once we have our subject, we need to stabilize them. And a lot of that uh, has to address many, several medical needs. And uh, uh, all of our members are medics at different levels. And, uh, and we have ongoing training at this facility uh, for our members to keep their uh, skills, uh, the medical skills, uh, up to speed. So then we come to the last part of LAST, and that's transport, uh, includes all methods of moving our patient from the backcountry to a location of care. And I think I heard someone talking about litter wheels. Uh, we're carrying tools up there. We also have a lot of uh, fun toys in a garage. Uh, and uh, by the way, those toys uh, were generously, generously donated by many members in this valley, and that helps us reach the subject, and also transport them out uh, to a location of care. So last thing I want to talk about is that we, tra we train as individuals. We train as team members. Got it. And we're also tested every five years by our peers. And our peers are other rescue teams uh, around the uh, Rocky Mountain region. And they evaluate us, and we do the same for them. We evaluate them. It's kind of a uh, wonderful system of uh, supporting each other. And we just finished our last reaccreditation. Uh, this team did extremely well. Matter of fact, the team does extremely well every five years because I don't think they could ever remember a time where we didn't shine when it came to reaccreditation. So great to have you guys here, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doug. So next we're gonna hear from Jeff Edelson. He's the president. He's gonna uh, give us a little bit of understanding what it's like from his perspective, and then we want to hear your questions. Thanks, Greg. Pull us a little closer. All right, there we go. Um, thanks, Greg. So as Doug echoed, I just want to uh, share thanks everybody for coming. You know, as he mentioned, our team we're an all volunteer rescue team dedicated to saving lives through backcountry rescue and mountain safety education. So our goal is really to get out, engage the community more, and really work on the preventative SARP, the PSAR side of things. So we're not just responding, we're hopefully helping prevent um, things. So as the uh, president of the team, I get to wear a couple of different hats. Uh, my primary job is really to lead this board, and I've had the privilege of doing that for the last handful of years. Um, and in doing that, I get to liaise with all the outside agencies. So it's been a great process um, in really helping develop and then continue our partnerships. We've got a lot of great partners out in the community, whether they're helicopter vendors, mental health, the county government, whatever it happens to be, we've got a lot of great partners that help us do our job of going out and really serving the community. So it's really important, and we'll talk about those, I'm sure, as the various questions come up. Um, as Doug mentioned, you know, we're, we're lucky. We're one of uh, a handful of accredited teams in the state of Colorado. I believe there's a little over 70 actually organized, registered search and rescue teams in the state of Colorado with the Colorado Search and Rescue Board. And I believe there's only 10 or 11 accredited teams in Colorado right now. And what that means is we've gone through a rigorous um, testing and accreditation process to really demonstrate that we're a deep team with a lot of skill. And it's something that we're really, we're really proud of. Um, it's something that earns us a, a type one designation in the international and the national FEMA system, which allows us to provide a lot of mutual aid and support all around the state. So our team's been involved with natural disasters. We sent teams down to the Boulder floods. Um, we've had people involved with other things outside the county. And we're really often called upon to go provide mutual aid to other counties. Um, I know of at least 10 plus times this year that we've provided resources to other counties to help them solve their problems. So that's something that we're really, really proud of being able to help with. Um, one of the other hats that I wear is, uh, not as the president, but just as one of the paramedics on the team is as our medical officer. Um, we're really lucky that we have a handful of advanced life support folks, and we're, I think, one of the few teams in the state that actually projects an advanced life support capability into the backcountry. Um, we've got a handful of doctors and paramedics on the team um, that are actually team members. They're not working with the, we work for the local ambulance company, but we're here as mountain rescue folks, as volunteers, um, and we can go out and essentially do anything that we can do in the ambulance, when you call it, we can do out in the backcountry. And we certainly do that um, in partnership with our two big medical providers, CareFlight and Flight for Life. Um, and we've had some very sick people in the backcountry this past year and in previous years that we've been able to um, really save lives because of the medical that we're able to push out in the backcountry. 
Um, and then one of the last things I want to talk about before we turn it over to you guys is our team structure. What you're looking at sitting up here on the panel is really the administrative side of our team. And yes, today we're the face of the team, but it's really important to mention that there's 50 volunteers on this team that go out and serve the community. And our job as a board is to really serve the administrative function of setting a budget, dealing with membership, dealing with the financial issues, things like that. But the group that Liz oversees, the rescue leaders, they're really the heart of our team. We have uh, 14 or 15 rescue leaders that um, are on call 24-7, 365, to receive that call for service, to receive that call for the emergency that's out there in front of us, and then decide what we're going to do. How are they going to triage it? How are they going to manage our, our volunteers? So when it comes out to us doing our job and going out and actually um, serving the community and helping people at the time of need, it's not the six of us. We serve as uh, six volunteers, but there's 50 folks on this team that really go out and serve the, serve the community. So that being said, I wanted to kind of give everybody just a little broad overview, and I'll turn it back over to Greg here. But um, I know there's a lot of questions in the room, so virtually nothing is uh, off limits, as Greg's going to mention. The only thing that we can't talk about tonight is any specifics on our rescues. So um, one of the things that we do is we don't second guess mistakes that people made or didn't make or talk about specific rescues. We're going to talk about things very generically um, today. Um, and then one of the other things you'll see is we um, feel it's very important to have an anonymity portion to our rescuers. So those that have read the stories that have been out in the press, you'll notice you don't see a lot of pictures of individual team member faces, um, and you don't see names in the press. When we go out and help people, it says Mountain Rescue Aspen. It's not as Bill, Joe, Bill, and Susie. Um, so it's one of the things that we um, strive is that when we go out, we serve as a team, and it's not any individual people. So um, any questions that are directed towards, I heard these people doing this or that type of thing, um, understand that we're, we're here to talk about the team and not individual things. Okay? Sweet. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> Working cool. on that. Thank you very much. So we can still thank our board, right? They are great. Six people, they are awesome. So let's hear some questions. Somebody's got a question. Come on up, Jesse. Yeah. It'll come on. I'll meet you halfway. Oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for everything you do. Um, hopefully I never have to call any of you. Um, <laughs> My question is very general. Um, you know, a lot about this is education, obviously. Is there a singular issue that makes up the majority of these rescues or recoveries that you wish you could educate, whether it's, you know, experienced mountaineers, every, you know, all the way to people hiking up to the Maroon Bells? Um, just curious if there's one thing that you guys wish you could express to everyone. Thank you. Um, I'll take the first question. Um, I think it's a great answer. You know, one of the common questions that we get is, how often are you guys out there getting folks that were ill-prepared, didn't have the knowledge, skill, ability to be where they were, do what they were doing, versus how often does stuff happen, right? Um, so I think it's important to open with about half of the things, kind of anecdotally, that we respond to are folks that had the knowledge, skill, ability to be where they were, do what they were doing, um, were prepared, and just things happen. And the other half of the time, it's folks that make mistakes, if we can call it that. Um, and I don't think there's any one specific issue that we can say everybody's doing this, but I think we see some common themes, and that's you know people not following the standard routes. Um, Yes, there may be a route that was described in some guidebook 10 years ago, but not following the standard routes and being up on top of a peak and looking down and saying, I think this is the best way down. Well, if that was the best way down, that would be described as a standard route. If that was the safest, most efficient way of getting down, right, that would be detailed, but it's not. Um, so I think kind of following those standard routes. And then we see people that are ill-prepared, right? So it's really important that you may be going out for your two-hour hike up the trail, well, two hours at 4 o'clock in the afternoon is great, but what if you twist your ankle and you can't hike out? Do you have food, water, um, you know, extra clothes, et cetera, to keep yourself warm? So it's kind of being prepared for the unexpected is certainly one. Um, another one that we've seen is people not starting at the appropriate time, seeing people trying to go climb peaks starting at 11 or 12 o'clock you know, noon, um, where they're not getting off the peaks before weather gets in, weather rolls in, um, and they're getting caught up in darkness or poor weather. Um, another one is volunteer separation. 
So we talk about that all the time where two climbing partners go out. And for whatever reason, I'm going this way and you go that way. Remember, you're in it together. You guys need to work through whatever your problems are and not voluntarily separate. And that's certainly uh, quite a few things that we do every summer is two people that started out together and for whatever reason they voluntarily separated, one made it back to the car and we're still looking for the other one. So um, volunteer separation is probably another thing that we deal with. And I'll certainly open up to the other folks if you guys can think of anything I'm missing. So I know that wasn't one, but some of the recurring themes. It's a lot. We also deal with a lot of medical emergencies. You know, and there's not sometimes a ton you can do to really prepare for some of those, um, other than kind of recognize that it is a medical emergency and, and get help quickly. So who else? Somebody else has got a question. I can tell. When you put a team together, when you put a team together, is every team member supposed to have the same skill set, or do you try to put a team together that puts together different skill sets and send them out depending on the uh, situation? I'll answer that. Um, so yeah, we have, all of our members are expected to learn all skills. Um, some are stronger than others in certain areas. So we may have some that are stronger in medical, some that are stronger in, in technical rock skills, some that are uh, very fit and can run up the trail very quickly if we need somebody to do that. But generally we will take whoever responds and put together our best team. Um, sometimes our teams will be minimal of two people as a hasty team to run up the trail or run out and be able to establish contact with a patient. Um, and other times we'll put together maybe four people if we have, uh, if they can take some equipment. Um, but generally we try to get a, a, a team out there as quickly as possible that we call the hasty team. Um, and we always have at least uh, you know, two people minimum. Some t most of the time we'd like to try to have four and one person would be a team leader, one would be a medical person, one would be safety. Um, and they go up and they make contact with that patient and be able to tell us back at the trailhead or here at the cabin what other equipment is needed to go up the trail and complete the, the mission. Does that answer your question? Yeah, please. Um, I just have a pretty similar question. Did you say that all 50 people, it's like kind of a two part, all 50 members are on call all the time as long as they're not, you know, like away? Correct. So yeah, it's just similar than similar to like the volunteer firefighter model, right? Everybody is around. If you're around and available and aren't tied up with something, then you respond if you're available. Yeah, I think I'm just thinking from like a hospital perspective when we have like X amount of people, we know who's on call. There's only a certain amount each time. So if mm -hmm. you get a ton of responses, say like, are you ever at a lack of responses? And then what would you do? Sometimes then we will send out a second page to the team requesting more, okay. um, you know, more people. Uh, we use a, a text uh, system um, that goes from through dispatch. Um, so the dispatchers over there can actually send out a page to the team. But once we're handed off a mission, um, we send out our own pages to the team requesting uh, resources. Um, and if we have a specific need, if we know we have a very sick person and we need that, a, that advanced life support person um, and they weren't part of that initial response that said that they're available, we may specifically then put out another page saying, we need a paramedic or we need ALS and we hope then we have one of those folks come. Yeah, and to kind of kind of build on it, we have a system where people can sign out, sign in. So if folks are out of town, we have a accountability program where we can see that it's October and 10 of our 50 members are traveling and unavailable. Um, and then we, as much as we provide mutual aid, we have the ability to receive mutual aid from our neighboring counties as well. So um, we're lucky that we have a very deep team that's very skilled. We're lucky in, in our community, in our county here. Um, so in general, we, we don't have a problem coming up with the number of responders that we need. But if we do get in that position, as Liz said, we can, you know, we can reach reach out further and make sure that we can still serve. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Who else? Let me hop right over here. Work this out of the room a little bit. <laughs> Hi. Well, thank you again for everything that you do. And I have two questions. One is because I you keep it to 50 members, so someone has to retire before you can let one of the pledges become a member? Is that how that works? 
and well, I can I can handle that. So, um, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, uh, what happens is the uh, membership's kind of always evolving. People have things in their personal lives that they realize they don't have the time to um, give to the team anymore. So we do get people kind of coming and going on a regular basis. But if we have a really good um, set of pledges and we want to put them all on, say we've got eight of them right now and we want to put every single person on, that would bump us up to you know 56. If every single one of those people is someone we want on the team, we might just do that. And then what we would do at that point is stop putting members on the team for a while until other members retire or fall off or whatever, you know, become inactive. Um, but yet, it has always um, been that we haven't really had a problem um, keeping that membership at 50. Um, but there's been, since we built this building, there's been a little more interest. So it's actually a little harder to get on the team, it takes a little longer. Um, you got to be pretty dedicated to want to be on the team uh, right now. So, and if I could just uh, pick up on what Debbie was saying, uh, the commitment is tremendous. Uh, the skill levels, the learning curve, the average time from the minute someone walks in and says, "I'm interested and I want to be a pledge," to becoming a full member, is two years. Uh, some people three years. Very rarely do we see people doing it less than two years. Uh, it's a lot of information and there's a lot of learning. My other question is, I'm sure you see some really horrendous recoveries, and I wondered if you have counseling available. We do. Yeah, we do. Um, the Aspen Hope Center has been our recent partner that helps counsel and do our critical incident stress debriefing of our team. Um, and then we also use the Aspen Hope Center to help with families as well. So they're a great partner of ours, and we're appreciative for their support. And um, the triad team from the county has helped us with things in the past, but the uh, Aspen Hope Center is a, plays a very integral part for our team and for the families that we, we serve. And we should mention that they are here tonight. So we do have a bunch of vendors upstairs, a bunch of tables. You can come check out gear and, and different stuff, and, and they are here. It's been a tragic summer in the Valley with you know a bunch of really sad news coming out very recently. So thank you. You got a question? Uh, once again, thank you all for, for all you do. It's tremendous. Um, uh, it's, it, I've sort of followed a bit of this discussion in the paper about uh, um, you know whether or not there ought to be signs on the mountains and better route finding and that sort of thing. And and you know I guess I have some mixed emotions about uh, and mixed feelings about you know how much signage you need to have uh, if somebody's going into the mountains. But one of the things that <clears throat> that is is sort of surprising to me is is uh, you know short short of being having a sign on on the mountain uh, there there seems to be remarkably little information even at the trailhead um, and and so you know w one of my questions is why is that and and um, you know this your your list of of ten essentials seems like uh, you know uh, something that ought to appear at every at every trailhead in some way, shape, or form, or and with with uh, you know more information on on you know how to how to get more information. You know, to, to me, I'm I, I don't fancy myself a, a significant uh, mountaineer, but it, but it is always shocking to me to see the people that I see walking up a trail at at two o'clock in the afternoon in their flip flops and a t-shirt when you know the uh, a thunder thunderstorms are, are rolling in, and you know there. But but equally, there's no information at the trailhead. To, to sort of give them a clue. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's, and I'll let the other folks here speak. That's a, certainly a multifaceted <laughs> question. Um, so we've we've had some meetings uh, as early as recently as a couple weeks ago with the Forest Service and the county on on signage. Um, and as you know, signage in the backcountry is a very controversial thing, right? Believe it or not, the mountaineering community. Um, isn't very supportive, and some wilderness advocates are not supportive of signage in the backcountry. Certainly, there's some balance, I think, to find. Um, you know, the team, we don't have an official position on whether we're for or against um, signage. And I, I think there are some interesting, there's some interesting literature on signage in the backcountry. Um, if you look at what's going on over in Europe, where signage in general doesn't, um, impact a user's decision to access the backcountry, right? By the time you've driven up to the Maroon Bells and it's 4 o'clock in the morning and you're hopefully going to climb starting early, you don't see a sign that says, do you have your water and, you know, make the decision to turn back around. 
Um, that being said, in general, in the US, we've done a very poor job of PSAR, as I spoke about earlier, preventative search and rescue. So um, we're trying to take it upon ourselves, at least in our community, and reach out to others to really work on the preventative side of um, trying to educate people on the 10 essentials. We've got a big thing on our website when you land there with a link to kind of safety documentation. And um, we're trying to push a lot of that information out there. Um, but it's, it's difficult to push that out to various users. Yeah. Right on. I mean, a great question, by the way, because uh, Mountain Rescue, are, we want to take this battle to social media. Uh, we, the best we can do, and I think we have a very good uh, example uh, for what, how many years have we been doing avalanche awareness? It's certainly been over, <coughs> over 30 years. We have made a difference. People are more aware about the dangers of the backcountry in the winter, specifically avalanches, than they were in the past. And uh, I think we had a very big part of that. And uh, we want to do the same thing for the, um, the summer months, the peaks. Um, and this is kind of a kickoff for us. We are taking this battle to social media. We're going to use many other forums. But uh, we have a, you know, everything we're talking about tonight, uh, being prepared. Uh, how to put together a team to climb a 14,000-foot peak. Um, I, I think we have some insight onto that, and uh, we certainly have a lot of knowledge because we deal with it almost on a daily basis. So uh, this is our kickoff. Uh, I think you're going to hear a lot more from this team um, on our commitment, or actually escalating our commitment to education uh, and using whatever means that are out there uh, to get the message across. Yeah, and just to close one one component on that, you know, one of the things that we've been trying hard to do is educate people on the difference between hiking and climbing and mountaineering, mm -hmm. right? Hiking trails are well marked, they're well established, well beaten into the ground, and climbing and mountaineering in general, you have to find your own route. There's not signage, there's not a, a nice yellow brick road, call it that, to follow. So. Um, we've been working really hard, and we're going to continue to try and educate folks on the difference, it's right, drastic difference between hiking and climbing slash mountaineering um, when it comes to finding routes and being prepared and being a little bit further out in the backcountry. I think it's worth, like, the specifics of your question, too, like, why isn't it there? And part of that is, you know, people call us all the time, and they ask us, they ask us for route information or condition information, and that's not... We're, we're not a we're not a guide service. It's not our goal. But um, as far as the signage goes, it's also not something we actually have our own control over. And so um, it's worth noting that that's really more of a forest service and to some extent the county's issue to you know work on. Yeah. No, I I don't think that should be <coughs> your role at all. I mean, I, but sure. but what I, what I don't get is why don't we? What, what why what, why isn't the forest service or the county or whatever you know who, you know when there's a sign at a tra at a trailhead. You know, it, it, there's there's a pretty mediocre map usually, uh, and and almost no other information. And it seems to me that um, you know that the Forest Service, the county, whatever, you know, with your help and prodding, sure. um, should be doing more. Yeah, it's it's interesting. We had a great meeting with the Forest Service, like I said, as recently I think it was three weeks ago was our last meeting. And one of the things they're struggling with is actually people stealing signs. If everybody anybody noticed the Deadly Bell sign. The deadly bell sign, I believe they said, has disappeared three times this summer. Um, so a lot of the signage that they're putting out is getting stolen. People want to take it home, right, unfortunately, the sad part of things. Um, and I don't think it's uh, – they seemed very open to signing trailheads, signing kind of the entrance to things, um, but they're struggling with – with theft, um, you know, even at the Maroon Bells, a highly used area, the Deadly Bell sign is missing right now, you know, and they're not going to replace it again until next year. So um, we are working with them. Like when you go up to the Maroon Bells, you go out to the Capitol Trailheads, they usually have like the three large panels, and we're working with them on trying to program that a little bit better, put some stuff like the 10 essentials and don't rely on your cell phone and don't separate from your partner and follow the standard routes and the things that we hit on earlier. Um, but in general, a lot of folks kind of have their mind made up by the time they, they hit those signs. So what we're really trying to focus on is getting information to folks before they leave their house, because we feel that's when we can really affect decision making. Can you help me to understand sort of what's happening in general in Colorado? I mean, on the one hand, there's a lot more people moving to Colorado, but on the other hand, 
people have better equipment, they have better guidebooks, there's social media, there's 14ers.com, 13ers.com. And so I wonder, is it statistically that we're seeing more rescues because there's more people or because people are less well prepared? Let somebody else jump on this one. I think it's both. I think, um, one, I think there are more people and there are more, more people going out and I think there's also a lot more people going out less prepared. But I also think that social media, even though it helps educate people as to what's out there, it also hurts in some ways that it, people get excited. They see someone going across the knife edge of Capitol and go, wow, look at that. That's cool. I want to do that. You can just hike up there and do that, you know? And, and I think people get excited about certain things that they see little videos of without realizing that they need to kind of work up to climbing a peak like Capitol or, or the Bells or Pyramid, um, and that that's kind of getting lost. I mean, there's a lot of information on 14ers.com and some other sites about, you know, routes on specific 14ers, but I don't, people, I don't think people always look at those. I think they get more excited about just the idea of doing it and being up there. Um, and, you know, and the same with signs. I mean, there was a rescue quite a few years ago where a woman um, went up to uh, go to Crested Butte. She got to Crater Lake, and there's a signboard there with a map on it. And she ended up at Snowmass Lake. Um, so she didn't know how to read the map. So, you know, you can put a sign and you can put a map there, but if someone does, doesn't know how to read the map, I mean, it doesn't say right at that signboard, Crested Butte this way and Snowmass Lake that way, but there's a map there, and I, I guess, you know, at some point in time, people are kind of expected to do a little bit of self-education. Yeah, and the um, one thing that we've also noticed is that there is a lot of sophisticated product out there. You go into any of these outdoor stores. Uh, starting with uh, our avalanche awareness, we found that everybody had a beacon. But I would have to say the majority of the people that we work with never turned it on. And so we made a commitment to educate our community and people outside our community on how to use a beacon. You can almost say the same with GPSs, with smartphones. There's a lot of technology that could be of great value, um, but I think that a lot of people don't know how to use it. And, um, and, uh, and they do, that's great. However, we think we can really add value by holding certain um, community programs on, uh, uh, in this building to show people that they have very powerful tools and they could really help them not get lost and also understand communication a little bit better. I think it's also kind of worth noting that all this information is so much more at your fingertips right now, whether that's Instagram, Facebook, or 14ers.com. I mean, I can tell you that even, you know, I'm one of the, I'm the youngest guy up here, but. By far. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, but I remember when I started, like, I had, Lou Dawson's book and Roach's book, it was an investment. You had to go buy a, I don't know if, what it costs now, but 20 to $40 book, and that, that was how you got started, where your information was. There wasn't, 14 com wasn't there. There wasn't all that information. And so I think it's, right now, all of a sudden, you, you know, Google tells you almost everything, every information, piece of information you need to get on how to get to the trailhead and probably how to get to the route. And so there's just a lot less time probably actually spent ahead of time reading about it, researching, okay, how do I even get to Aspen, you know, b before Google Maps, right? <laughs> so I think it's worth noting that it's it's less of an investment now and it's at your fingertips. And, you know, of course, the population, like you mentioned, is skyrocketing and finishing the 14ers is the cool thing to do, I guess. So, you know. Yeah, I'd, I like, I'd like to say one no, more thing, too. Yeah. Um, uh, Colorado obviously has the 14ers in the, in the country, right? There's only one other state that has 14ers in it. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, two. Three. Um, at three, sorry. Um, you're right, three. Uh, forget about that. <laughs> so um, Colorado just is popular, and we have the most amount of peaks to be able to go out and tackle. What people don't do, and I don't think is happening personally, um, is that people aren't doing their homework and learning their skills young enough and practicing them long enough that they feel comfortable being able to go out in the out in the backcountry and be able to attack any kind of any kind of obstacle that they see. Um, so I think you know Debbie said that people see it on Facebook, they see a video clip, it looks cool, 
they have the information at their fingertips, they can get the route information, but they don't have the skills to be able to go out and complete it safely. So I think people just don't spend enough time, young, young enough, being able to learn, you know, hone their skills to be able to go out and actually go do things safely. Yeah, I think the last component of your question was kind of a statistical question on the amount of traffic, right, that we're seeing in the backcountry. So I think you saw, uh, I know we put those up quickly and the slides will be available on our website for people to go look at. Um, Statistically, this year for Mountain Rescue, our numbers are pretty level with what they've been the last handful of years. The number of search and rescue calls in Pickin County has increased. We've worked with the sheriff and the county, and the sheriff on his own has done a really good job of being able to triage things and kind of work through stuff before they notify our team to help work through them. But the number of overall calls are up. And certainly, we're seeing an increase in traffic in our backcountry, right? If you ask the Forest Service, I think they claim a 40% increase up the Maroon Bells this year. I believe it was Sunday they shut Maroon Creek Road down. They just said, traffic is backed up to the roundabout, bumper to bumper, and they just said, we're done, shut the road down. Um, So it can't be argued, right, that the traffic up to the backcountry has increased a lot this year. Um, And we're luckily, we're not seeing double the increase in traffic, double the increase in calls, right? So um, I think folks are able to recreate safely. Hopefully some of our education and the education that people are gaining on their own is certainly helping. Um, but we still are having those issues out there that we're having to deal with. So our goal is to try and continue to decrease those numbers further. And I think just one other thing just to tie into what Jordan and Liz was saying is there are a lot of great resources, you know, 14ers.com, but that brings everybody to 14ers. And it's interesting sometimes to talk to people who have go through their list of 14ers, but ask, well, how many 13ers or 12,000 foot peaks or 11,000 foot peaks? That's kind of what Liz is talking about, like working up to it. And that list of 14ers wasn't designed to be like a natural progression to get into technical terrain. It's an arbitrary list of, of elevation. So anyways, a uh, couple more questions maybe. And then the idea is we're gonna kind of come upstairs, check out the building, you know, chat with a member, meet a vendor. Uh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm not a ringer, I'm actually a team member, but I wanted to dovetail. I wanted to add on to the social media question that I think this young lady asked. I think one of the elements in sort of trying to interview people that are out there amongst social media is that we all make visual judgment decisions. So if each of those posts the videos or clips of these peaks that are drawing in beginners or first timers, if everyone were dressed in a full alpinist suit with a coiled rope like the mannequin upstairs, (laughs) it would subliminally say that they're either prepared or they're not prepared for that. But because social media, they see us dressed in the way that we are now. I mean, I imagine there's some fairly accomplished people in this room in various sports and fields, but we wouldn't necessarily make those visual judgments. And so that is the, I guess you could say, a proverbial trip up for social media is I see a stranger through a public post on social media, I make a judgment that I'm equal to on par with them based on how they look, and therefore I can also make that same climb or hike to that location. That makes sense? Any other questions? Okay, I want to thank you guys all for coming tonight. Um, like. Greg mentioned earlier, we have vendors upstairs, so please visit upstairs, take a look. There's a lot of information. Hope Center is also up there, and I believe Aspen Strong as well. And also don't forget to stop by um, our table out front, and you can buy some swag, uh, make a donation. It's much appreciated. Everything helps. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah, and real, and real quick, one more time, you guys heard us talk a lot about our, our partners, and hopefully I'm not missing anybody here, but... Um, like we mentioned, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did this year without tremendous support. So uh, Pickin County provides a lot of support for us. We work underneath them. We're a separate organization, but we work underneath them, and they provide a lot of support, so I want to recognize them first. Um, and then our two big medical providers, I, yes, it's a plug for them, but Flight for Life Colorado and Care Flight Colorado, we utilize them a lot. And in fact, we send them directly to scenes without us on board because they can more quickly get there and provide medical in the backcountry. So two really big partners, and then certainly the military and HATS. 
um, T Lazy Seven, Eco Flight, the Aspen Hope Center, Capital Creek Outfitters, um, and then the Ute and Bristlecone both provide a, a lot of support and fundraisers for us. So I'm sure I left somebody off the list, and for that I'm sorry, but um, it's really important to recognize our, our partners, as I mentioned. Um, but yes, thank you everybody for coming. There's a whole bunch of Mountain Rescue folks in shirts, so please uh, meet somebody and, and have a chat. We appreciate you coming. Building. If you haven't seen our facility and want a tour, I'll be uh, happy to take a group of people and just show you around a little bit more.